think like most architectural practices, we're trying to fashion uh, a game uh, with a set of rules that uh, exist within the discipline of architecture and a set of rules that we're kind of making up as we go along. Um, and so uh, those rules might relate to the specific constraints of the project or um, the kind of original uh, let's say, reference that we're making. Our overlay metals with history. A lot of our projects tend to use something familiar, something recognizable, um, to which we will overlay um, a sort of second layer of interpretation, playing with the kind of most iconic formal operations on something highly recognizable to kind of give a second or more subtle um, reading of the piece. I guess the, the end game is through multiple means to always return to something familiar. So we like to make references to uh, magic acts. Uh, and that the, uh, the most interesting part of the magic show uh, is not when the, uh, the magician cuts the assistant in half, but rather when the uh, assistant <coughs> is, uh, is shown whole again. And then literally with the drawing on the wall, kind of a comical, literal interpretation of the prompt, which is overlay, overlaying the drawing on the wall. I would say outside of architecture, we like to reference um, uh, comedians. We're really fascinated with uh, the, the one-liner. I think most recently I've been looking at like Mitch Hedberg, who made this, uh, this figure of speech called the Paraprosdokian, very famous, which is like a, uh, it's a two-part phrase where the, uh, the second part of the phrase is meant to contradict the first part or subvert. For a long time, I think if you look at like, let's say, uh, you know, some of the, even the New York Five architects, there was this interest in, let's say, the self-referential, right? Um, or I think another instance of that would be, um, we like to look at like, Roy Lichtenstein's um, like, perfect and perfect drawings, um, where essentially it's this kind of internal rule structure. Um, that's self-contained, right? So he'll take a square canvas and uh, draw a continuous line within the frame. And then he'll take um, a similar sized canvas and allow that line to break the frame. So the two drawings are essentially producing a right and a wrong um, that is self-contained. Um, and you can't necessarily reference anything outside of the two things you're looking at. Essentially why I think the one-liner, the paraprosodokian, tends to be uh, kind of fascinating because you have all of the information uh, that you need to both get the joke, appreciate the joke, tell the joke again. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. So the, the subject can't be too timely because it should resonate over and over again and be relevant still. So um, the content can't be too loaded with trendy or, or subjects that have a set sort of setting or time. So again, like, like most projects, we started with, let's say, a familiar image. And uh, the chairs, that was uh, an image of a, an American Windsor chair, which I think is uh, your grandmother's chair. It's very familiar, um, almost forgettable. Um, and so uh, using that as a starting point, something conventional, something familiar, um, we were able to uh, apply some, some modifications, some subtly, some less and subtly. <laughs> uh, and uh, those all have to do with, um, I think, how the, the chair is observed when someone is not seated in it. Um, I think the moment you sit in the chair, um, the, uh, the games we're toying uh, around with fade. Like the Windsor is always symmetrical about the vertical axis, so it's using the same rules to then make the adjustments. Each type has a specific uh, assembly uh, logic or rules that govern that Windsor type. So it was kind of playing with the type and the rules that governed that. I mean, they were also originally conceived as a dining set. And so if you, let's say, remove the, uh, kind of the seated occupant from the dining set, um, can the chairs begin to act as characters as well? Uh, Take on a persona. Exactly. Yet as we kind of continue to exhibit them, we're testing out like other um, it's a context to position them in. And there's some chairs that 
Thomas hates that I love and vice versa. But this is the kind of neutral set right here that we put in the gallery. Yeah, I'd say the only constraint we really have is that at the end of the day they need to be chairs. Um, we're not dealing with the issue of utility or function, like that was already, that was the context, that was the given. That was really just about the kind of formal aspects. So again, like previous projects, we began with uh, like an iconic reference. Uh, in this case, it was uh, uh, a 1960s photograph of Marcel Breuer seated in a chair in front of, I think, one of the most famous windows in New York City, um, which is a large trapezoidal window. Uh, at the Whitney Museum that faces Madison Avenue. Um, and again, the idea there is to kind of quite literally overlay another gallery experience within the existing gallery. Yeah, hopefully it's iconic enough that people recognize that it's what it is, that the Whitney window. Um, and another sort of common theme is extending the shelf life of old forms, old icons, old um, projects. And it allows us to toy with uh, drawing, which is something we're really fascinated with. Uh, specifically, uh, different uh, drawing projections. So in this case, um, uh, again, trying to toy with the illusion that the window is casting light on the chairs, um, where there's actually a wall. So slightly elemental and fairly dumb. We hope that it's a, it's a quick joke can register, uh, and it doesn't necessarily alienate an audience. I think the goal is that it's uh, kind of an inclusive game. And for a long time, architecture has been obsessed with um, uh, close reading as opposed to close looking. And close reading, like irony, I think, tends to kind of alienate um, uh, the architect from his or her audience. Um, I think when you're playing a close looking game, um, the idea is that it's all inclusive. Potentially, we can step away and enjoy it the same way as an audience member would. The, uh, the Architectural League holds a very special place uh, for our practice. It was the uh, first competition, first project we ever really did together was uh, a submission to um, uh, the Folly competition. And while we didn't win, um, it kind of set the tone and foundation for a lot of the let's say, graphic sensibilities comedic tones. Working uh, <laughs> in different cities, seeing if that would even work. And so it's really fun to, uh, in some ways, come a little bit full circle back and have the opportunity to exhibit some, some work we've done elsewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, as part of the Architectural League, but also in New York City, which is interesting.